Oh, isn't that wonderful? The sound of summer it's just oozing out of your radio speakers. Uh, it's Mal Pope and I still think about you. And uh, I heard that a few months ago uh, on the radio and I thought, hello, I like that. And so we started playing it here on Nottingham Hospital Radio. And I'm so pleased that the gentleman whose voice you heard on there is now joining me on the radio. Good morning, Mal. How are you doing? Yeah, very good morning and uh, and welcome to a very sunny Mumbles just it, outside Swansea. Yeah, it's a beautiful morning in Swansea. Oh, it's lovely because there's no windows in the studio, so I don't oh. know what the weather is like out there, but I'm so pleased it's really nice because I'm off on a boat uh, on the river a little bit later on tonight, so I'm hoping the weather's going to be nice. So Lovely, 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 lovely. Good. Well, nice to speak to you, Kevin. And, and nice to speak to you as well, Mal. Now then, you came from a musical family, um, don't you, with, with your mum, your grandmother and your great-grandfather all being very musical. Yeah, oh, I mean, I suppose the culture at that time, particularly my great-grandfather, uh, David Hopkins, uh, David Glandour, as his bardic name was, you know, the, all, all the sort of like community stuff, uh, music happened around the chapel. So New Silo Chapel, uh, just around the corner from where I was born and brought up, my grandfather would conduct the orchestra. And they used to have an orchestra, you know, right around the turn of the last century, um, in, made up of members of the congregation. It, it was so much more about uh, their community as well, creating music. My grandmother became the organist in the chapel, a massive chapel. Uh, and you know, I I was she was four foot tall and five foot wide. I always say about my grandmother <laughs> Mavanwi, and I used to love it when I used to see her little feet dancing on the the pedals for a big church organ. She, I mean, she she it was beautiful to see. So yeah, lots of music, but most of it was chapel music to be honest. Until my big brother came along and bought a stereo. Uh, he also bought a, uh, a a Spanish guitar. So I nicked that and I listened to his Simon and Garfunkel records, and I think that's where that's where the downfall happened. It was downhill from there on in. <laughs> Well, I don't know about downhill. It's 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 definitely on on the rise. Uh, your career is at the moment, and it's it took took long enough really to, to you know to get that rise on there. So, do you, do you think it was um, the sort of was it written in the stars then that you you would go into music with with all that musical heritage behind you? Yeah, to be honest, it was written in the stars. I'd become a teacher like everybody else in my family. Oh. In fact, my dad, who only passed away last year, was still asking until his final years, wondering when I was going to get my teaching certificate, just in case. <laughs> um, so, yeah, education was a big thing again, you know, coming from those sort of mining communities. Um, you know, education, you know, boxing, maybe playing sport or rugby or um, not so much music, really, but education was the way out. But I, I suppose I'm... I was quite single-minded even as a kid, so it was it was due to a, a friend of my my big brother David. His, one of his friends said uh, he he liked the songs that I was writing when I was ten, eleven, and twelve years old, and he said you should you should send these to a chap called John Peel on Radio One. And and if I'm really honest, I was te- well, I was twelve years old, and John Peel's show started at ten o'clock. It was past my bedtime, so I'd ne- I'd never heard. I mean, I knew Jimmy Young and I knew Tony Blackburn, but I'd never heard of John Peel. But I, I got my dad's tape recorder, recorded the songs, and sent them off. And I think they, I mean, can you imagine? They must have been horrified, mustn't they? A 12 year old Welsh singer songwriter sending a tape in. Can you imagine how you'd feel, Kevin? <laughs> well, I tell you what, if they sounded as good as what you sounded back then, um, then I wouldn't be horrified at all. And obviously, I mean, John Peel is an absolute legend, uh, yeah. God rest his soul, in radio. And he's created the careers, uh, as everybody knows, of so many people um, that, yeah. that have sort of had massive careers. So for for him to actually, uh, well, it was um, it was one of the people who worked for him who, who wrote back to you, didn't he? And and he yeah. said to ask your dad to give them permission for you to come down because, as you say, you were only twelve years old. I mean, that must have been brilliant, I suppose, for for not only you but uh, for your dad to have that recognition for you. Well, uh, I've got to say that they, they weren't totally sure, you know, sex and drugs and rock and roll and all of that. And uh, so the, when, I, when I actually got onto the radio, because John P was fantastic and his, and his producer, John Walters. So I went up with my brothers. Uh, they paid for two tickets. My mum paid for the third because there were three brothers. We all had new suits. We did the session. I was more excited about meeting Jimmy Young than actually recording. Um, but w- my parents wouldn't let it be put in the local paper in case people found out. Because <laughs> they weren't quite sure whether this was the right thing for their, well, by, I was 13 by that age, by that time, this is the right thing for their thirteen-year-old son. You know, I mean, can you imagine? I mean, it's a very small community uh, in Swansea. They came; they were teachers and chapel goers, and then suddenly to have you know long-haired hippie types, you know, phone in the house and having pictures taken. I mean, it must have been such a sh- culture shock for them. I took it in my stride, I think, because. I used to watch Opportunity Knocks every Monday. This thing happened to people every week, didn't it? You know, people would turn up uh, and the next week they'd have a recording contract and the following week they'd be number one. So I sort of, 
<laughs> I was sort of expecting it in a strange, odd fashion. Now, there was one long-haired hippie, which uh, was also a very big help uh, to your career. Um, Reginald Dwight, of course, Elton John. Um, I mean, he he was a massive boon to your career in, in those early days, wasn't he? Oh, he was fantastic. Uh, it was strange because John, John Peel got in touch with all of his contacts and said, he's only 12, 13 years old, this kid, but the songs are you know what they are and they, they were they were very proud of the session i think and so uh, they, it came down to a couple of record companies uh, that that wanted to sign me they said i should sign with elton john because they knew elton and rocket records um there's but they you know they should say we should tell you there's another record company interested we think they might be a bit fly by night they're called virgin records oh, but wow. um, we need to tell you about them uh, so it, it could have been very different i could have been one of the first signed to virgin said instead of signing for rocket but elton was terrific um i mean they they picked me up from the station on my first record Recording session that week in a white Rolls Royce. There was a, there was a telegram waiting for El, from Elton from uh, America where he was on a, on a massive tour at the time, saying, you know, wishing you all the best. He called me Madwin in that. He could never quite get my name right, Kev, because my <laughs> my full name is Maldwin, Maldwin Pope. Yes. Uh, but um, he used to call me Bloodwin Pig at the beginning because there was a <laughs> he, couldn't, he couldn't remember it because there was a band called Bloodwin Pig. Then he eventually got around to calling me Maldwin. Uh, which is okay. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> it's getting there, isn't it? <laughs> it's getting closer and closer. So yeah, he used to call me. So it was Madwin, Bloodwin Pig, and then became Maldwin. But you know, he was always interested in the career, and eventually he became my my record producer. You know, he took me into Abbey Road Studios to record, um, and you know, those I was still only sixteen by that age, and it was. It, I mean. Can you imagine? I mean, sometimes I look back and think it's somebody else's life. But thank goodness I've got the records to prove it. You know, and Elton sang on some of them as well. So, yeah, it, it really did happen. And, uh, I mean, you, you were still writing uh, music at that time as well. And one of the songs that you wrote, um, Andy and David Williams recorded and had a, quite a big hit in America with. Yeah, and I, that's a strange story because one of the again one of the champions of my career in that early in those early years was a guy called Paul Gambaccini, the broadcaster, and he interviewed Andy and David Williams. Now they were they were Andy Williams's nephews. They were sort of the next ones off the production line. They were the, the Osmonds, the Jackson Five, and the Williams twins, as they were called. And he interviewed them in London, and he said, "Well, this is a song that you should record." I don't know how to say goodbye, and and they did, and it, it got into the um, the Billboard Top 100, uh, and you know. Again, it was this was all happening, but my parents never. I, I never went to a stage school or moved to London when I was a kid. I'd do my stuff in the school holidays, and I'd go back then and have a a fairly normal life, you know. And then I'd go back, I'd, and and I'd and I'd come back from London and say, oh, I went to a party with Elton John, and Ringo Starr, and they go, yeah, 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 okay. Where's the autograph? Right, the autograph book. Yes, yeah, it's, it's true. And then two days later, we'd be onto something else, you know. So in many ways, it kept my feet on the ground. I think. Now then, um, moving forward, uh, uh, quite a few, well, a few years uh, from that as well. And this is something which I didn't realise until I started digging around in your past. Um, you were also the voice behind the Fireman Sam theme. <laughs> How did was, you get that yeah, gig? I, I love Fireman young, Sam. I needed the money. Ke- I mean, you know, no. Um, <laughs> it was strange because in the early sort of 80s, I think it was, um, you know, the, the new fourth channel happened in England, uh, Channel 4, and then Wales with a thing called S4C, Channel uh, Pedro. Yep. Cymru. Um, and they, they wanted to make programs to sell as well as programs for Wales. But obviously, if you're making programs in Welsh, in those days, it was hard to sell them abroad. It's a bit easier now since all the Scandi documentaries and, you know, and dramas have come out. But so making cartoons seemed to be the obvious way forward for them. So, in fact, the first one I did was a, was a thing called Super Tet. Who's the bear shoots through the air that. like a streak of red? Super Ted. Um, and we, we saw <laughs> for a while we called it the market and Feynman Sam came along. It was just another demo at one stage. Are oh, they going to make one, make a cartoon or a stop motion animation program about a fireman? And some friends of mine were involved in doing, putting the music together and they said, would you, would you do the demo? And then we did the real thing. And, you know, all these years on, on my YouTube channel, Fireman Stan is still the most watched video of all of mine, which is <laughs> it, which is very pleasing and galling at the same time, Kev. <laughs> yeah, so, with, with, with all the wonderful music that you, you've sort of written and, and you're bringing out at the moment, people remember you for Fireman Sam. Fireman Sam so, yeah, but, uh, never yeah. mind, at least they're remembering you. That's one good for thing. For something. Yeah, yeah. it's funny because I went to um, my university career, I went to Cambridge to do economics. I went back about 28 years later. And as I walked into the fellow's garden, it people you know obviously people's careers take them in different directions it was somebody saying john are you still at the treasury and then they, all weekend they were all talking about how, how wonderfully well they'd done publishers of bridget jones's diaries but all all through the weekend one by one they came up to me and said 
did you really sing Find My Son? <laughs> and uh, as I was driving home to Wales at the end of the weekend, I thought, is that all my life's going <laughs> to amount to? But there we are. Here we are. It's good to have something, as you say, something to be remembered for. Oh, definitely. Now, earlier this year, I had the pleasure of being sent a musical, an online musical called Broken Instruments by Phil Bagley, uh, who I know well through the theatre. Uh, and you performed a lot of that soundtrack um, along with it was it was it Kelsey, uh, Kelsey Shaw I think who's Kelsey from Shaw's Nottingham one, yes. yeah um, yes. so I mean how how did that come about how did you get involved with with Phil and and the whole Broken Instruments thing well Phil and I have been friends for a very very long time in fact on his first recording I did all the backing vocals so that is that was before the war wow. uh, and over the years we've been involved in lots of I mean wonderful project that that Phil is a very very humble man. Uh, but he comes up with these projects like there's a thing called City of Gold, the Golden City, which is a, uh, a it was like a poetry and music all about visions of heaven. And it, it, it got into the American gospel charts that was in the 90s. And he keeps on coming up with these projects. And I'm, during lockdown, he said, look, I'm working on a new project called Broken Instruments. Would you be able to do some of the singing? I, I'd be delighted. Um, and of course, we're all in lockdown. So Phil would send me the. The, the, the tracks and I put my vocals on and I emailed those back to him and it was wonderful seeing the whole thing develop because it's a, it is a terrific story have you have you told your audience about it do they know I, what the story is about I yes I, I mentioned as when I um when I had the um the, the sort of good luck to be sent for it to be sent to me and I watched over it and listened to it mm -hmm. uh, and everything and yes I oh, I just couldn't wait to tell them and I just wish I'd got the soundtrack to play uh, some of them but uh, I really am hoping that does come to the stage um, sometimes so that people can experience that the I mean Phil Bagley is an amazing songwriter um, oh, and yeah. um, I, I've seen a few of his productions before and they they really are really very classy and I can't wait for this to come to stage so that every Everybody can actually, you know, just see this, um, you know, and, and just experience what what a wonderful songwriter is and how good the music is. Yeah, well, there there is. I mean, I don't I don't think I'm giving away any secrets here, but there is talk about it next year yes. in Derby. So yeah. uh, I'm looking forward to that uh, very much. But yeah, it's a story of of a violin, really, of a violin and a violin maker going through the Holocaust and how music has a redemptive quality yeah. for everybody involved, you know, and it's very very poignant. And, yeah, a real joy to be involved with Phil's projects, all of them. Now, you've also written several musicals yourself, including one about uh, Welsh boxer Tommy Farr uh, called yeah. The Contender. Uh, and, again, that goes back with, with you mentioning the boxing uh, school as well. Um, I, I mean, are you, are you a boxing fan? And who was Tommy Farr? Because I, I don't know an awful lot about boxing. So who, who was right, Tommy, no, Farr? Tommy Farr? Right, he was the British heavyweight champion in the um, early 30s. And he went to the Yankee Stadium to fight against the, the Brown Bomber, Joe Louis, in 1937. Given no hope at all, uh, but he took him the distance. He went 15 rounds with Joe Louis. It was the first transatlantic sport in broadcast. So, wow. you know, lots of people remember that they got their televisions for the Queen's uh, coronation. Yep. Well, a lot of people bought their radio so they could hear that Tommy Farr fight. And he was, he was a, I mean, he was the biggest sportsman of that generation. He had his, you know, waxworks in Madden Two Swords. He stayed in New York uh, and, and got friendly with uh, all of the New York's boxers, but also that mafia connection that fixed fights. And uh, he never won in New York. And his, his trainer, who tried to persuade him not to go to New York, is a guy called Joby Churchill, a one-legged saddler from Tonopandy. <laughs> And uh, so actually, so when when Tommy came back, lost all his money, he had to do everything like go on tour. He so he he made records with. Um, oh, who's the guy who played the ukulele? Um, George Formby. Windows. George Formby. Yeah. yeah. I would say George Foreman, but he's the one with the with the, with the cooker, isn't he? Uh, George For Formby. Yeah, don't mix and... those two up. <laughs> Burn your fingers on that. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he, he toured the country with a group of singing miners. I mean, it does sound very cliche, but he did. So it sort of lent itself that basically it's it's rock. The musical, but instead of being from Philadelphia, it's a it's a Ben Knuckle fighter from from the Ronda who does go to New York and that, and that whole sort of mafia connection as well. So, yeah, we we still you know, we still live in hopes. Musicals are such a difficult thing. Someone once told me ninety percent of musicals don't get made, and um, ninety percent the ones who do aren't successful. So we've we survived to the next stage, and uh, I still live in hope that uh, we'll be able to revive it at some stage. Well, hopefully. The soundtrack is out there um, as well for people to listen to. Um, I, I was listening to a bit of it last night and uh, I, I, I just love musical soundtracks. And when it's something uh, about something that I don't really know a lot about, it, it's an education to me just to listen uh, to the music for the stories uh, that come through that. 
Now then, your latest single, Summer's Gone, um, that comes 47 years after your debut (laughs) single, uh, which was I Don't Want to Say Goodbye back in 74. uh, And radio stations uh, have this year been picking up on on the songs that you've been writing just recently. I mean, does this feel like you're becoming an overnight success at last? (laughs) Well, I still dream big dreams, Kevin. You know, you'd think by now I'd have learned my lesson. You know, when they say madness is repeating the same thing, expecting a different outcome. But with music, you know, it's uh, you just have to, and with lots of things in life, you just have to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah. I really was when I was 13. I was in exactly the right place. By 1979, I was managed by Harvey Goldsmith, you know, just signed a, a deal with EMI. And I was in completely the wrong time because punk was happening and I was totally in the wrong place. So... You know, perseverance, isn't it? Perseverance. I, I don't know. I just, I, what else am I going to do? This is what I love doing. And I'm very, very fortunate. And I know that I'm very fortunate to still be in a position to do that and to put records out and to make new music. I'm, I'm trying not to make old fashioned music, but I'm making music of my generation uh, and, and looking at the new stuff that's on the radio and everything to, to be inspirational. So still working this, with the same old guys that we were in school with, uh, you know, the same band for the well, best part of best part of 50 years now because we were in school together. So um, it's, it's it's still a joy. And I don't take that for granted because a lot of people don't get a chance to even try to, to get their dreams to work. You know what? I think if you've got a job that you really enjoy doing, um, it, it doesn't become a job. It, it's no. it's it's a pleasure. And with music, I think if you enjoy making music and you, you're making a living out of it, um, I, I think that way it, it, it becomes such a pleasure and you want to carry on doing what you're doing. Yeah, well, occasionally I do make a living out of it, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, the radios have picked up on these last two singles yes. um, as well, and you know I'm hearing them on on different uh, radio stations now, and and it's it's good to hear that because after I heard um, the, the the one that we played before, I still think about you, and then when um, when Phil sort of passed. Uh, you know, pass the uh, musical over to me. And I thought, Mal Pope, I know that name from somewhere. And it's because I'd heard it on the radio. And uh, and then, yeah. of course, you know, if I'm listening to it, then I'm sure that a lot of other people are listening to it as well. So, uh, you know, um, it, it, the word is spreading, which which is great stuff as well. Um, yeah. So now, how do we find out a little bit more about Mal? People who are interested, uh, if they've heard that, you know, the, the music and everything and want to find out about you and your music, how can they find out more about it? Well, the, the easiest way is to go to the website, malpope.com. It's got all the links to all the social media and to all the streaming sites and to all the videos. And because I've been doing this such a long time, I've got... I've got a whole different, you know, selection of careers going on, a portfolio career. So some of the TV stuff where I'd be interviewing, I'd be doing your job, interviewing Cliff Richard and playing songs with Cliff and the Bee Gees and all of that. So it, it, it all links through malpope.com. And, um, and and I'm always, you know, delighted if people, I mean, if people do like stuff, if they get in contact with social media, just to sort of say they've heard it, um, you know, that's because you never know, you know, once the songs go out there, you never know who they'll touch. And, mm. and, and some of them, you know, when you get some great messages back saying they've helped me through a difficult time, all those years of doubt actually have some sort of meaning as well. So, you know, if people do like what they hear, then it would be lovely to hear from them. And if they don't like it, just keep quiet, really. Just well, keep exactly. Quiet. Just shut up. Mention it. Yeah, and, and go and listen to somebody else. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that they do like. So, Mal, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you this week. I could chat forever about all the people that you've worked with and the people you've, you've known. Uh, unf- unfortunately, we've run out of time uh, on this, but we'll have to do this again. When uh, when is the next um, single or the the next album due out? So uh, there'll be a Christmas record. Oh, brilliant! Uh, there'll be there'll be one in February, and then there'll be another one in March, May time. So they'll, they'll keep coming. If that's all right, Kev, they'll keep coming. We're trying to build some sort of momentum. Y- you know we'll, what? We'll grind we'll grind them down eventually. <laughs> you know what? I welcome I welcome that. I can't wait to hear the the, the new stuff um, because I'm I'm wearing out my singles. <laughs> <laughs> so, so new ones yeah bring them on Mal it's been lovely to speak to you um, have a wonderful day uh, in, in sunny mumbles um, and uh, I, when I get out of it hopefully it's going to be as nice enjoy and bright as it is over there enjoy the river enjoy the river oh I'm, I'm, so, I'm so looking forward to it uh, and hopefully the, the title of the, the new song won't sort of no. sort of bear true because hopefully we've got a little bit more of summer uh, to come, especially after yesterday. It was a gorgeous day yesterday, and um, yeah. you know, fingers crossed that uh, it's going to last for a little bit longer. Uh, but the new single is called Summer's Gone, uh, and, uh, and we'll play that now. Mal, have a brilliant weekend and lovely to chat to you. Yeah, God bless. Thanks for your, thanks for your time. Take care, Mal. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. 
Hi, Mouse, still there? Oh, lovely. Thank you so much for that. As I, said, I was looking at the clock and uh, it's speeding by and I've got more questions, but <laughs> I've got to get a couple more. No, no, no. That's, that's fine. No, no, that, 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 I mean, it'd be better if people, you know, spoke like you speak uh, on the radio than uh, having to force it out of people. But but no, it's been lovely to chat to you. And uh, as soon as we, uh, we, we get the new ones, we'll start playing them as well. Um, no problem. I shall, uh, I'll put the chat on Facebook and SoundCloud and everything else and spread it around. And I'll, I'll link you in with it as well. So, all right, take care, Mal. Thank you for that. Bye-bye.